Ok. Bueno, muy buenos días para todos y todas. Eh, Good este morning evento. to everyone. This event will have simultaneous interpretation in Spanish and English. You can select your language of choice by clicking on the globe at the bottom of the screen and selecting your language. On behalf of the Pan American Health Organization, we'd like to welcome you to this seminar on let's speak a, uh, about brief interventions to address uh, drinking. My name is Dr. Mario Zapata. I'm a regional advisor on alcohol and drugs at the headquarters in Washington, DC. I have the honor of moderating this event today for which the entire team of the non-communicable diseases and unit of mental health and substance abuse of the organization has put every effort into preparing for today a program that will support the work you are doing in this area. This event would not be possible without the participation of our distinguished panelists for whom we'd like to thank for their time and dedication to today's effort. And thank, we'd like to thank all of you from countries in the region who are with us today. Special thanks to our country office, to the region of the Americas, and to our representatives and consultants and participants who have helped us with organizing this event. This event has also been supported by colleagues from other uh, regions and, and uh, We'd like to thank them for their participation. At the end of today's event, we'd like to renew with all of you, the participants, your interest in the importance of implementing brief intervention models for the initial care of drug and alcohol problems, and therefore uh, add this to the primary care for uh, persons and families who may require support. The recording of this webinar will be available on the YouTube channel of the organization. It will also be available on the web page of this event. And in the chat, we have put the link to YouTube and the link to the event's web page. Next, I'd like to remind you briefly about today's agenda. We hope you'll be able to be with us during the hour and a half allotted for this webinar to discuss the topics proposed. Your questions and concerns can be put in the chat and we will, as uh, much as possible, consolidate the responses to uh, uh, make sure we uh, uh, stick to the time allotted for this event. Thank you again for your participation. Today, we have uh, the installation of the webinar by Dr. Renato Oliveira, the Mental Health and Substance Use Unit Chief. And following that, we will have talk about uh, experiences and possible brief interventions that could be useful in uh, dealing with alcohol and drug use problems. The first speaker will be Dr. Thomas F. Babor. Then we will speak about brief interventions for primary health care, uh, who will be presented by Dr. Guillermina Natera. And then advisor Pablo Norabuena Cardenas will talk about a motivational interviewing. And then Dr. Jose Zapotznik will present the brief and strategic family therapy model. And we will conclude with the uh, experience of the unit of prevention, treatment, and rehabilitation of the United Nations with Dr. Angie Buse on a program called TreatNet Family and how it is applied in the Americas. So without any further ado, I'd like to ask Dr. Renato Oliveira, the head of the Unit of Mental Health and Substance Use at PAHO in Washington to address a few opening words. Go ahead, Dr. Renato. Thank you very much, Mayro. Uh, my name is Renato Oliveira, the head of the Mental Health and Substance Use Unit in PAHO here in Washington, DC. And on behalf of the Pan American Health Organization and the Mental Health and Substance Use Unit, I'd like to extend a specific, um, particular greeting to the panelists and all the participants in the region. We thank the panelists who have generously shared their time to, with us today to share their experience on, in this webinar. One of the main goals of this uh, panel is to promote the implementation of efficient and effective models for 
persons who have alcohol abuse disorders or psychoactive drug disorders. This seminar is one of the priorities of the Sustainable Development Goals, and it attempts to implement strategies to improve access to healthcare services. And this specifically uh, deals with goal 3.5, which is to strengthen the, and the prevention of the drug abuse and the improper use of narcotics and the harmful use of alcohol. The purpose is to improve access uh, to health services for people who use drugs or alcohol. And this usually presents a major challenge. One is the stigma that people who have these problems face and the lack of knowledge and the lack of training of human resources in the health area to use a proper therapeutic approach. The stigma can extend to even uh, health policy decisions which do not give priority to dealing with uh, persons who have drug or uh, alcohol abuse problems. Therefore, in the national health programs, they don't include prevention strategies or the necessary treatment strategies. Drug consumption disorders are one of the risk factors that lead to premature death and illness in the region of Americas. And there is an increasing trend uh, to have to be the 10th uh, the disability adjusted uh, life years uh, in the region. And for countries in the Americas, it is the fifth reason. The death uh, uh, life loss caused by drug and alcohol consumption could be avoided through more preventive actions and through the improvement of access to health care. And, and not insignificant is the use and abuse of alcohol in the Americas. Well, we estimate that direct mortality related to alcohol is 360,000 deaths per year. That is 5.4% of the total number of deaths. And we calculate that we lose more than 526 years of healthy life for every 100,000 inhabitants due to disease or premature death. We are gathered here today to talk about this brief intervention strategies that could, in the primary health care structure of the countries, could become a very cost-effective tool in order to identify early on and manage people who have the risk of alcohol consumption or drug use in general. For the moment, we hope that we can awaken in you greater interest in this method and that we can have broader discussions in our countries that will lead to strengthen the health care for people who suffer from alcohol or drug abuse disorders. Once again, I'd like to thank the participants, the invited guests and organizers and support staff for this webinar. We hope that this webinar fulfills our expectations and will renew the interest for this very important topic in the region of the Americas. Thank you again, and uh, best of success today. Thank you very much, Dr. Renato, for your words. We now have uh, Dr. Thomas Baber, who I have the pleasure of introducing. He's Professor Emeritus and head of the Department of Public Health Sciences at the University of Connecticut School of Medicine. His academic training is in social psychology, addiction sciences and psychiatric epidemiology with distinguished experience in research and the detection, diagnosis and intervention, early intervention and assessment of treatment as well as policies on alcohol and drug abuse. He has worked with the World Health Organization in the development of tests for the purpose of identifying alcohol, uh, drug abuse uh, screening tests and tests for the detection of the consumption of alcohol and other uh, psychoactive drugs assist. The last edition of uh, publication in 2022 has been uh, very well received, and uh, the newest edition is also well, well when received. Dr. Baber will speak to us about brief interventions, definition, and the potential usefulness for alcohol and drug use problems. You have the floor, sir. Thank you. And um, 
Thank you for joining this webinar. I'm going to be talking about the uh, uh, history of brief intervention research and the kinds of, uh, of uh, information it provides for our healthcare system to deal with alcohol and drug problems. Um, so to uh, get started, the screening and brief intervention and referral to treatment is a, concert, a concept uh, that in English we have come to call SBIRT. And basically, this is a way of talking to patients uh, about alcohol and other drugs and to estimate the risks that are involved for that particular patient and to quickly provide them with some feedback about the future risks as well as the current problems that they're experience, which have been identified in a screening test. And there are now numerous screening tests that are available in English and, and Spanish and many other languages. Uh, there are the, the most uh, uh, used uh, screening tests are uh, developed in, um, uh, by the World Health Organization and available through PAHO, but they all share in common the aim of identifying current or potential problems with substance use and to have a brief conversation that motivates patients to think about change and then to start changing their behavior. And all of this can be done very quickly in uh, the application of a screening test and uh, giving feedback to the patient. And there has been a lot of research on this topic over the past 40 years, starting with the WHO Amethyst Project, which uh, was conducted in 10 countries around the world, including uh, Me Mexico. Um, and the basic uh, premise of this research was to do a clinical trial that compared simple advice that took only five minutes with brief counseling, which uh, consumed up to a half an hour of conversation with the patient uh, to the results from a control group that only received general healthcare advice. And what was found is that the group that received just five minutes of simple advice about the results of their screening test that identified them as high risk drinkers. Uh, the people who received simple advice did a lot better, significantly better than the control group. And the people who received brief counseling did even better than that. The results were not dramatic, not every patient responds, but the important thing here is that the advice that was given and the motivation that was provided after a year of assessment seemed to get a significant number of patients to reduce their drinking. And this concept has been extended through numerous studies to other types of substances. The next slide. Um, can I advance the slide here? Okay, so another study that was done uh, with randomizing clinics found that it didn't matter who gave the advice. The advice could be given by uh, a nurse or a doctor who specializes in brief intervention, or it could be uh, given by uh, a primary care healthcare worker. And after a 12 month follow-up, the clinics that were changed, uh, trained to provide this uh, simple advice or brief counseling uh, had reached uh, large numbers of patients, but uh, the results were about the same when they came, when the advice came from the 
the primary care provider who was a doctor versus nurses and other healthcare workers. Next slide. Uh, this idea has been translated through another randomized trial conducted in four countries by the World Health Organization. And again, what was found was that after screening using the WHO assist, which covers alcohol and numerous other substances, the people who got the simple advice in their primary care settings uh, were doing better at uh, six month follow-up to the people who got uh, no advice. Next slide. These results have been replicated in numerous studies around the world, uh, systematic reviews, and they have been compared to uh, outpatient treatment. So if you take chronic cannabis users, and again, you give them either two sessions of simple advice or uh, up to nine sessions of brief counseling, uh, outpatient treatment, you find similar results. The more intensive the intervention, the better the results, but uh, simple advice with screening seems to make a difference, particularly if it could be monitored uh, by the primary care department. Next slide. The uh, procedures for screening and brief intervention for alcohol, as well as uh, alcohol and other substances have been described in manuals that are available at the WHO Geneva website, as well as the uh, website uh, at PAHO. And basically, the guidelines for screening and brief intervention have been refined and have been evaluated in numerous studies around the world, which allows us to conclude uh, that simple advice should be considered one of the main uh, best buys that are promoted by the World Health Organization in their SAFER initiative. Next slide. So one question that arises in part because it's been difficult to implement universal screening, and then to train healthcare workers to do these procedures, uh, to get to a point where screening and brief intervention uh, is available to patients in primary care, care settings throughout the world, uh, we need to be able to do an extensive amount of tree of of screen of uh, training, and we need to be in a position to um, uh, reach enough patients uh, so they can have a population impact. And the question is: Do the screening and brief interventions that are conducted? even in uh, well-developed healthcare systems, are they sufficient to have a population impact on, on uh, alcohol-related morbidity and mortality, as well as that for other drugs? And the question, is, the, uh, the answer is that unfortunately, we've not been able to get to the point where enough screening and brief intervention is done to have a population impact. That doesn't mean that it's not possible. And what I'm going to do is share with you some insights about where SBIRT could be going with new technologies. So with the growth of SBIRT programs, and uh, we're in a position to say that uh, the benefit is not going to be enough, particularly in the area of drug abuse. And the Next slide shows what we would like to see. And this is alcohol consumption going down and life expectancy going up. 
And we know that this is achievable when uh, it's implemented at a population level by in decreasing availability, increasing the cost of alcohol, and, and regulating alcohol marketing. Uh, some of these approaches could be implemented into what I'll show in the next slide is a form of uh, population level uh, expert programs. And what we're trying to do is that uh, public health approaches at the system level should be implemented using social media and community-based information sources to uh, make screening available, refer patients to treatment, and to even conduct the brief interventions in combination with clinical interventions that go on with the, within the healthcare system. Next slide. So we're going to need creative strategies. And PAHO, for example, has begun to implement some of those. Uh, and idea, the idea is to bring expert to a wider audience through screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment and messages that are contained in the expert uh, brief interventions that can be broadcast at a community and even a national level. Next slide. Even referral to treatment can be done by making an inventory of available resources, including self-help groups and online uh, types of interventions and making them available to a much higher audience. And randomized trials so show that when you engage people in treatment or brief intervention earlier in their drinking or drug use career, you can have a much broader impact. And especially the research has begun to show that digital interventions using uh, social media uh, as, as a way to contact with potential patients and conduct screening is sufficient and almost equal to individual level interventions that are conducted by trained experts. Next slide. So social marketing of expert messages can be conducted through the kinds of things that have been studied and used effectively by the pharmaceutical industry itself. The messages that say, ask your doctor about this drug or that drug. Well, we can broadcast these messages to ask patients to ask their doctors and their healthcare workers, uh, what about uh, screening for alcohol uh, problems? If you know a person who has an alcohol problem, ask your doctor. If you think you may have an alcohol problem yourself or would like to find out more, uh, go to this website. So these messages are much better than what the alcohol industry does to encourage people to drink more, but with this coded message of drink responsibly, which doesn't seem to do anything but direct people to drink more. What we need is healthcare workers delivering the messages. Next slide. Uh, the uh, Canadian government funded a study that communicated the message that alcohol causes cancer, which is one of the uh, messages that um, uh, is in the ESPERT program. And by communicating this message, there was a 7% reduction in uh, alcohol consumption within the healthcare system. Next slide. I'm going to conclude here by saying there are a number of adaptations of experts. Solo voy a concluir aquí diciendo que hubo un número de expertos, peritos. Okay. So Ahora, okay, muy bien. In conclusion, uh, en conclusión, we get numerous messages uh, from the expert program. 
diversos that, mensajes uh, del programa este que le comunican a los pacientes use, los motivos que subrayan eh, su uso menor de estos uh, elementos como lo son el alcohol y las drogas. So thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Gracias, Dr. Weber, por su, por su presentación. Thank you, Dr. Weber, for your presentation. You provided us excellent guidelines to be able to highlight the importance on the use of these different uh, screening tests to achieve uh, greater reductions in alcohol and drug abuse. And it's important for us to engage in these activities to achieve the desired results. We have set aside 15 minutes for each one of our presenters to be able to stay on time. Next, we will yield the floor to Guillermina Natera. She is a medical researcher from the National Research System in Mexico, director of the PAHO Collaborator Center and from the Ramon de la Fuente Muñiz National Institute of Psychiatry since 2003. She's also professor for the School of Medicine at the Autonomous National University of Mexico. Dr. Guillermina will talk to us about the effectiveness of the implementation of these uh, different uh, mechanisms at the primary health care level. Thank you very much, Dr. Zapata, for the opportunity to participate in this uh, webinar. In the meantime, I'd like to say that the objective from my presentation is to share some of the experiences that we've seen in Mexico. As uh, my colleague mentioned, we have many national strategies, but in Mexico and in the Americas, the brief uh, interventions at the first uh, or primary healthcare level has been very efficient and scarce. So while we wait for the presentation to be shared, we had the opportunity in 2018 to be invited to a multi-centric project in which we had the participation of uh, Mexico, uh, Mexico City and Bogota, Colombia, as well as Lima, Peru. And a number of countries uh, participated providing advisory roles and the purpose was to assess the best way to uh, undertake an early intervention program to reduce the excessive use of alcohol and comorbid depression. And this uh, primarily geared to primary care facilities. And so I'd like to discuss this uh, study. It's been the source of many publications, uh, which we are happy to make available. But for the purpose of this webinar, I just wanted to describe the four branches. And when we did the statistical analysis, we determined that branch number three which apply to Mexico and Colombia, involved the brief uh, training, brief materials, and uh, community support. So this was not as limited as branches one and four. Just briefly, I'd like to mention the three phases of the first project. And this involved a number of different authorities in Mexico, along with all of the authorities from the healthcare network. And we also engaged in a great deal of work to prepare all of the materials used in the project. We used uh, panels with patients. So these uh, materials have been tested so that they can be used for comprehension purposes when addressing these issues with patients. From 2019 to 2020, we conducted a training phase and then moved into an implementation phase. Then COVID arrived in March of 2020. And during this period, 
we will present data that we believe to be extremely important because Mexico was training professionals to be able to address the COVID pandemic, especially with patients who were adversely affected by that disease. So these three phases led to a sustainability project that we have called the ABC project. Apply, offer, and channel all of these materials to people that suffer from excessive consumption of alcohol and drugs and that also suffer from uh, depression. After the results of the projects, we conducted some analysis and the ministry in Mexico approved a, a follow-up to this program, which is the 2023-2024 version of the project. The methodology is very straightforward. It addressed the uh, brief interventions, and in this case, the healthcare facilities were asked to focus on all patients that are or that were 18 years of age or older. We also uh, needed to get uh, informed consent by parents when. Uh, addressing patients that uh, were on the younger part of the range. So we provided them with the care, we offered uh, the information in various pamphlets, and we undertook a number of actions. We provided feedback, positive reinforcement, uh, counseling. If there was any clinical study that was ordered, and they were sent to specialized treatment with uh, healthcare professionals, and this was very well received. And uh, we had a scoring system from that we used, and uh, in this part of the phase, that uh, we had a risk level of three to six. And we also referenced uh, certain specialized treatment and also determined that these projects were extremely useful, especially for cases involving patients that were subjected to interviewed. So they felt that it was very useful for us to discuss these issues with them of excessive use. And when we talk about uh, patients uh, that are un suffering through some crisis and that are also, uh, under conditions of depression, they were the ones that uh, really benefited the most by these interventions. So the idea was to also provide them information through pamphlets, because many times uh, I don't think would be that important because I don't have these problems, but they could be very useful for me to provide them to other people in my circle of influence. Now I'd like to show you a comparative analysis between the first stage and the current stage. And we can see how much we've uh, achieved in terms of training healthcare professionals with regard to the program and the results that we've seen. In the quasi-experimental phase, we trained uh, 337 healthcare professionals and during the sustainability phase, we trained 941 healthcare professionals. The average age of the professionals in this case was 36 years of age. The breakdown was the one that appears here, 71% women, 29% men. And in terms of a professional breakdown, we had Physicians are represented to the tune of 55%, nursing staff 26%, psychology specialist 12%, and others 7%. And many of the uh, patients that uh, showed some improvement uh, had uh, the following breakdown. The, Average age was 45 years, the breakdown, uh, gender breakdown was 60, 40, uh, favoring women. In terms of their schooling, 44% uh, received basic uh, 
education. 34% uh, attended middle school and 22% uh, attended uh, higher level education. The sustainability phase uh, shows the following big breakdown. We saw the, 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 the breakdown between women and men, 59% women. Uh, the school education was the breakdown that appeared here on the, on the slide. During the healthcare emergency due to SARS-CoV-2, we had uh, professionals that had a brief instrument uh, that was easy to apply to identify different uh, levels of uh, alcohol consumption risk and the presence of uh, depression symptoms. Mexico was the only country that continued the application of these forms of detection without interruption during the COVID-19 pandemic. During the COVID period, we did not uh, complete uh, the, the entire circuit of activities, but we can see here the template that we asked patients to fill. We provided them with a copy and we used this information for the corresponding statistical analysis. The results appear on the screen, the before and after comparison during COVID as it relates to alcohol consumption. We saw a, a lower or smaller population at risk uh, during COVID. And this was during the prior period, 2019, 2021. And in 2023, we saw some changes in the numbers. It's interesting to see the middle risk uh, and what happened during COVID and how healthcare professionals were adequately prepared to be able to uh, provide care to all of the population. Now, since that time, we've seen uh, an increase in these types of patients to various healthcare facilities. What struck us as interesting is that both prior and during the COVID pandemic, we saw a slight increase in high risk consumers uh, of alcohol, but that has more or less uh, controlled. Uh, there are a number of hypotheses that seek to explain this, but we are still looking at this and analyzing it. What did we find in the before and after COVID or during COVID? What we found was that 6.8% of the population or that attended a healthcare facilities prior to COVID at a certain risk level. And for the current period of 2023, we see a much larger population that is uh, going to these healthcare facilities because they have these symptoms that we have been focusing on. And therefore, our uh, early intervention has been much more effective because we are receiving the patients at a stage where early intervention will prove to be more effective. Next slide, please. In terms uh, of risk uh, of people believing or thinking about death, we saw a certain representation uh, during COVID, 4.6. And we did see a, a slight bump uh, in 2023 of people seeking more help with greater frequency. But since COVID, we've seen in 2023 that uh, the number of interventions uh, on average were 10.3, but uh, during COVID, it was only 4.6. All of this to say that we continue to use uh, during the current year, the data from these uh, periods. Next slide, please. Other results that the study yielded and that uh, involved the Mexican authorities as well as authorities from the various foundations that provided support for the project. And we saw the following conclusions. Uh, 30% of the population uh, received a timely detection of alcohol issues, uh, or if 30% uh, were addressed, uh, then we could uh, achieve uh, 
a reduction of over 16,000 deaths. For every 100 pesos invested uh, in the scale-up program, we could save 185 pesos. The next slide is the cost analysis. The strategy proved to be very cost-effective, and we see the breakdown here between the costs uh, in the three participating countries. The costs in Mexico were significantly lower, both for the alcohol detection, detection plus brief counseling, and detection and referral to treatment. These data are based on the data collected during appointments. And in the 10-year projection, it was determined that if we were to assess the condition at of one of out of every two people, we could reduce alcohol consumption in the 15 to 34 age group and the 69 and over age group. So how has this information worked in Mexico for brief detections? So we were able to overcome the known challenges uh, such as there's no time, we're not healthcare or mental health experts, uh, patients don't want us to ask them about their alcohol consumption. So through awareness, training, and approaching patients uh, more directly with healthcare professionals, we were able to bring about some change. What we saw was that the training with health professionals, many believe that they could contribute to their communities, uh, despite the fact that they didn't believe that they were experts. So as mentioned, uh, we undertook the necessary awareness campaigns, training, and constant uh, support for healthcare professionals so that they could uh, master the, the information that we wanted them to learn more quickly. We established uh, sensitive liaisons um, and uh, once they were convinced uh, of the benefits that could be obtained with the brief intervention and their implementations, we were able to achieve greater results. Next slide, please. In terms of community actions, uh, we had a number of uh, very rele relevant uh, campaigns, uh, awareness communication campaigns through billboards, pamphlets, and videos. We were able to count on the necessarily necessary material, including various instruments, pamphlets that we were able to distribute. And we also were able to demonstrate to our healthcare professionals that received the training that they would always enjoy the constant support from the program. Nowadays, uh, we don't just have them on paper, but we have them participating actively in the program. We needed to demonstrate that the instrument is brief. It was very hard to convince these folks that this was the case. Nevertheless, uh, they were persuaded that the easy application was an average uh, duration for an intervention between two and five minutes. We all know that the detection more than likely would take more time, but people or patients that would go to these healthcare facilities that and that were seen by these professionals that received the training were able to undergo a much more brief intervention. And so it, we used our, our scorecard to assess the patients. And I'd like to recognize the work of the professionals and the, the effectiveness of the training received by them, as well as their participation in the detection process with curricular value, or they could get a credit, uh, continuing education credits uh, for their work. Anderson et al. in 2021 concluded that receiving training increased by 9.8 times the application of detections compared with those who were not properly trained. We are a, the availability, continuous availability of materials such as detection instruments, a training manual, pamphlets, posters, and inform informational videos for the target population is extremely effective. And so those professionals that receive the training 
were able to train other colleagues uh, in their own right. And this was uh, an initiative that stemmed from uh, the first uh, training phase. The support for the com community campaign, as mentioned previously, was significant to achieve a larger number of detections. We were able to persuade healthcare professionals that brief detections provide very valuable information to guide the risk-based uh, prevention and identify potential areas of influence in their respective healthcare centers for the benefit of the, their population or the population that they serve. Lastly, it was very relevant to provide periodic uh, reports uh, to the healthcare community as well as uh, healthcare facilities and networks uh, regarding any improvements and advances made with detections and the risk levels. Lastly, something that is very relevant, we recently promoted that mental health become a part of the integrated care provided to patients at the first line of defense in primary health care. This led to, as, to a result in which uh, we were better able to reach the target population. And recently, we adopted a policy to include uh, mental health in the portfolio of activities that are already a part of the campaign. So these results uh, led us to believe that, that we could go to the healthcare authorities in Mexico and propose an entire intervention that includes mental health treatment. And uh, we are more than welcome, or we are more than happy to work with other collaborators in this regard. These are some examples of the various awareness campaign instruments and elements, calendars. We also have different things for children. All of these uh, different uh, pieces allow us to communicate the information and has led to very effective and concrete results. Lastly, I think that I've surpassed the 15, the allotted 15 minutes, but I wanted to recognize the team members that I've been working with during this 2023-2024 uh, period. And we have the team members who provided support uh, throughout the entire process. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Guillermina, for your presentation. Based on uh, quasi-experimental studies uh, that demonstrate that brief interventions and detections can lead to significant improvement in these uh, rates of uh, excessive uh, abuse of alcohol, especially when we consider different uh, mental health con considerations and all of the complexity that we discovered during the pandemic and how patients are affected by these uh, different uh, situations and this quasi-experimental phase uh, proved to be very effective. Now we'd like to yield the floor to Pablo Nora Bueno Cardenas. He's an advisor for the mental health department for the Ministry of Health in Chile, and he's an adjunct professor from the public university in Chile. He will talk to us about the motivational interview to improve uh, the condition of patients who suffer from excessive uh, alcohol abuse. You have the floor, Pablo. Thank you, Dr. Mario, Mario Zapata, for the invitation to be able to discuss this. And I want to thank you for the opportunity to engage with colleagues from all over the region. And uh, I extend greetings to all of you. Yes, the motivational interview, most of the people that are connected have heard about this. There's vast information available online about this uh, concept. So more than giving you the details about motivational interviews, I'd like to talk about our version of the importance of the model of, of brief detections or fast detections that we use in Chile 
as part of the development of a national program that has been in place for a year. I don't have a, a lot of uh, relevant information about uh, alcohol, but uh, for that reason, we brought in other collaborators, uh, the an advisor, advisors from the mental health department, the Ministry of Health in Chile. And for the purposes of this we webinar, in addition to some of the other collaborators, we also work with Inebria, the International Network on Brief Interventions for Alcohol and Other Drugs. They've been working in this regard for many years, and these are the collaborators that we work with. Just to provide you a framework of what I wanted to demonstrate is that in our country, we have this program, and the name is Brief Detections and Brief Interventions, program and assisted referrals on alcohol and uh, drugs. This dates from 2011, so it's been in place for 13 years, and it has been operating without interruption, including during the COVID pandemic. This is one of our great, most successful programs. And when we began this, we were operating in 25 communities in the metropolitan region in city, in the city of the capital city of Chile. And we worked with uh, 30,000 patients um, who underwent the screening. And this is a population that at the present day, now that we have national coverage, has grown enormously. In Chile, we have 360 communities or, and near the cities, we have uh, the largest uh, communities. And that's how we are able to expand the representation of patients in the program, be they in the North or in the South or wherever. Uh, like any other pr proper program, there's adequate uh, funding for this. We have agreements that we renew every year with different uh, stakeholders. And that's the overall uh, framework of the presentation, but the financial model the mechanisms are such that uh, we involve all of the stakeholders that are relevant. So now I'd like to focus on the technical model. The technical model takes from the WHO model that has been promoted for many years. Uh, we see all the main texts uh, that uh, serve to drive the initial incursions into this in something very important for us was the work that developed in the US. So we understood that brief interventions are, as you all know, are very simple and brief interventions that are designed to be able to respond in a timely way to patients that suffer from excessive use of alcohol. Now, in many cases, we cannot uh, predict uh, or foresee other problems or issues, but it does allow us to address the consumption issue in a much more effective way. That notwithstanding, we do see some social problems that stem from this type of uh, condition. The use of alcohol is not necessarily related to people who have alcohol disorders, but actually people who uh, drank and drove a vehicle. So what we'd like through a brief intervention is to reduce uh, perception of risk with regard to their own consumption and to encourage motivation for change and to encourage and provide information and simple tools to bring about change. And I'd like to say this because the fact that somebody's open to do something is probably the main goal. But we also keep in mind that brief interventions are uh, intrusive. We ask them about alcohol, we ask for somebody who came to ask about something else. So that's the spirit of a initial brief intervention. So it's often normal that a person does want to answer the questions. But for somebody who's new to this, they're surprised by the information provided. And that's why motivation may not be achieved through brief intervention. These have said 
for me, this kind of intervention could take only five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 in the worst of all cases. So to have a conversation where we show what we're seeing is a adequate goal for this kind of intervention. We have a technical model in Chile uh, that is available. We use the audit guide, first of all, and we use slides that support intervention, the material that is given to uh, low risk consumers. And what I wanted to show you is that the uh, brief interventions only has two or three steps to it. So I wanted to show you how brief it is. Uh, the first is to intervene. Let me let me show you the, the, this on the left hand side. The first purpose is to intervene in some way. S step one is to evaluate the level of risk and do a screening and we use audit. And then that instrument gives you risks of level, low risk, high risk, uh, average risk. As, and each one of these risk levels uh, requires an intervention, either a brief intervention uh, or assisted reference when there's high level consumption, uh, or drinking, or we, uh, we usually do it through a brief intervention. We also what we do what we call a minimal intervention. Because people aren't static. Sometimes they are high risk drinkers. Sometimes they're low. They drink a lot, drink less. So we, this is the typical in brief intervention model. And the scores may, may vary based on the uh, instrument used, but the outcome is the same. And over time, we've added other tools, uh, but the head, the, uh, net, the health network has two years of experience using this program. And so in some places they have, uh, decided to provide uh, support and monitoring. And so we have uh, a scoring instrument that determines the level of risk, similar to audit. And uh, here on the right, you see the image shown by Dr. Baber, the manual that's available for a brief intervention of drugs, which is promoted by WHO. We also use the craft uh, tool. Uh, it, it's a very more sensitive tool for uh, drug consumption amongst adolescents. Uh, we have our own guideline that we prepared uh, to for interventions with adolescents, and it does generate the levels of risk as part of the screening tool. These screening tools are very good uh, guide and helpful guide in scoring. The scoring means something, and that's why when you are discussing this with the patient, it's easy to tell them what they and the need to do. That's why the intervention is the crux of the uh, effort. Now, let's say we have a brief intervention. It's a uh, it reinforces non-consumption or low risk uh, consumption and a minimum intervention is used with people who do low risk consumption and we congratulate them and we invite them to continue with this and we explain why they're considered low risk and we thank them very much and let them go if if, if we have um mid-level intervention or consum risky consumption the main focus is uh, uh, motivational intervention. And the key element is in first to uh, provide feedback, to tell them, look, this is your score. And that means this, the, the, your risk because of this. And then we add advice and recommendations for treatment and a recommendation to decrease consumption. It, it could be the re de re decrease. It, it could be done through different ways as well. Or changing the context where you consume, for instance, showing them how they can do it in different ways. And then uh, we 
ask them if they're interested in what we're talking to them about, if they, if they want to know more. Uh, and in other words, let them know that they don't, they're forced to do this. Just after talking five minutes with somebody, they, they, they came in say for, because they had pain in their stomach and then somebody asked them about alcohol. So finally we have to uh, assess, assess the goals. A lot of times the feedback says, uh, talk about the amount of alcohol or where you drink. And then we do monitoring. Uh, uh, that's the goal, of course, to have, check on them and see how things going. But it, it, it's usually uh, brief interventions are only one session. And then what we encourage is self-monitoring. And for that, maybe it's helpful to have a calendar for instance, and show them uh, the calendar, how and they can write down what they're doing so they can see it. The, the motivational interview, as I said, is a general provision for the development of uh, brief interventions. Uh, do, it includes doing the, the screening and the referring the person and then uh, supporting them and monitoring. It can be defined as a type of uh, collaborative communication aimed at goals that pays particular attention to bringing about change. And it's designed to strength, bring about uh, personal uh, motivation to change. And, but it must be done in an environment of uh, acceptance and compassion. It's all in, in, in this, we also should consider if too much information is provided. Uh, if you combine this with other uh, methods uh, well known by everyone, or the model of the uh, Calroy uh, consumption model, but this it should be used more as a communication method rather than a theoretical uh, view. And in in, in the spirit of a motivational interview, we have to develop a feeling of uh, friendship, companionship with the person, and be accepting, be empathic uh, with the person, show compassion. And it's important to the person to know that they don't have to be forced to change, it's their own wish to change and, and acknowledge the strengths of the person, uh, work, uh, talk about their strengths and their the good side. And then under compassion, we must be compassionate and uh, to show that we want to see the uh, well-being of the patient and, and show uh, that we have uh, you know, priority to their needs. And in there, we have to do evo evoke the person's uh, feelings. The process of the motivational interview, we have to show commitment to a specific uh, therapeutic goal and to be focused. The motivational interview is a type of communication, collaborative communication aimed at goals. Very often, you need to recognize that person may not have a motivation to read us their uh, drinking. When we talk to people, we uh, told them about uh, alcohol risk they had, and it, it's possible that they still don't want to do anything about it yet. Now, to evoke another part of the interview is so when you have established a focus on what to work on, then you, there are techniques to get the person to talk. We, you have to listen to the person. Uh, and you could say things like, well, yeah, or perhaps I should, or maybe I should, I'd like to. That all shows you that the person is open to listening to ideas and planning. Planning should be negotiated. Uh, and, and must be agreed to by the person. And the plan has to be realistic. That's very important because our obligation is to uh, ensure that, the, or try to ensure that the person is successful. That means that the reduce from drinking five uh, 
glasses of wine or five beers to uh, which is considered a risky consumption and to to decrease that and maybe to two two drinks that's considered less risky and so I invite the person to reduce from five to two drinks and it, it, but you have to be careful that the goal is not too high if you say two or no drinks at all or zero drinks then you are really setting them up for failure because the, if we set them up for failure the attempt fails the person fails and we as recommenders fail everything is bad so i would recommend to do some planning to get closer and closer to the ideal goal in other words to to pose and allow them to reach goals there's another strategy ors in english open question affirmation reflection summary and also ask open-ended questions and also recognize that people do have weaknesses and strengths uh, uh, well, you have to be empathic in your listening and uh, in some a summary is another technique when you summarize when the person said to you you allow them to correct what your perception was and it allows you to get to know one another have a better understanding of the person now i can't go into detail 15 uh, minutes of the type of training for this but i'd like to invite you to look at this information uh, training is the best way of course of uh, of, of doing a brief interventions and it, it perhaps it's helpful to talk with colleagues that have more experience in this and patient is, is not only helpful for brief interventions but other types of interviews so i suggest that you, the most important thing is that the intervention has to continue being brief here are some things we learn a brief intervention is done by somebody who comes for help and it's not doesn't have to be a specialist that responds all people are looking for is an opportunity to talk to somebody so it should be a flexible tool and you have to adapt it to your own cultural environment the way you work and more than just a flow chart and tools and instruments etc all the things i've talked about that, that should not be more than a tool that leads to a conversation, a friendly conversation that results from somebody who comes to you to ask a question about something else. So it has to be brief, and that helps you uh, succeed. I, here is the Inebria page that you can uh, look at. And if you're interested, you can participate in the annual meetings of the network. They're very interesting. And uh, a lot of people learn a lot about it. So the next one will be in November in Barcelona. Thank you very much for your participation and for listening. Thank you, Pablo, for your presentation. And uh, that's a very practical therapeutic Local focus that will be helpful to many participants where you talked about the practical and useful ways you can use a motivational interview for this purpose. Next, I'd like to invite Professor Zaposnik, uh, uh, he's a professor in science and public health, director of the public health of, uh, National Drug Abuse Treatment Clinical and he works at the University of Miami. He is coordinator of the Node Alliance National Drug Abuse Treatment Clinical Trials Network of the National uh, of the US National uh, Drug Abuse Institute. Dr. Zaposnik will speak about um, BSFT, the Brief Strategy Family Therapy. He is one of the creators of this system. You have the floor, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Zapata. Thank you to all. Thank you, Dr. Zapata. Today, I'm going to discuss some uh, strategic uh, family therapy. In English, we refer to it as brief strategic family therapy, or by the acronym BSFT. And this is a therapy that has existed for some time and is grounded in more than 30 years of research. Many of them are treatment models for adolescents who suffer from drug abuse or 
excessive use of drugs, delinquency, social relationships, and all of the usual interactions. This is a very practical ter therapy. It is a very directed therapy that's based on a series of studies, not just uh, based on the effectiveness, but also looks at the clinical base of the intervention. And today I want to talk about that more so than the evidence. Another key aspect of all of this is that this is a therapy that doesn't require the commitment of family members with the therapy, but rather part of the therapy is to provide families with the necessary tools that they will require to get involved in the therapy. The research and the development of interventions have been funded by various national health institutes and by the uh, substance of use prevention centers in the US. And in terms of conflicts of, in uh, conflicts of interest, the university is the proprietor or the owner of BSFT and I am the uh, lead researcher on this. To understand BSFT, we need to recognize that it's a therapy and families change because any love that is trapped within the framework of hate can't grow. So our work at BSFT is to transform intra-family interactions and move them from anger to love, from the negative to the positive, from the conflicted to the collaborative, and from the habitual to the proactive. Many of you worked with the delinquents that are drug users that have antisocial behaviors. We all understand that when these families get to treatment, there's a tremendous amount of conflict in the family and a great deal of negativity. There's a great deal of interaction with a very negative spin to it. And the idea behind that therapy is to transform and use that negativity to define those love links within the family. And we use that to change the family behavior. The content behind all of the family conflict is always associated with negativity and a number of issues uh, that become conflictive. These can only be transformed when we use love as the key driver to highlight these relationships. So when a father tells an adolescent, you're a disaster, you're a problem, you're a headache for all for all of us all the time. Sometimes I would I wish you would disappear. And this is what we hear many times when parents are really at the end of their rope, they're totally exasperated with their children's conduct and behavior. So we focus on one aspect of the communication between that father and that son. And so we talk to the father and say, sir, you feel very upset about your son's behavior. You worry a great deal about him. Is this due to the fact that you really care about your son's future? Usually if parents or the father say, of course I'm worried about him. Well, of course you worry about your son. You don't worry for the other or you don't worry about the other young man in the neighborhood, but you worry about your son because you love him, right? You want the best for him. And so this is what we do. We try to twist negativity and we use it as a linkage to change this perspective. And we base this on a context 
in which the father can talk to his son about his concerns, his aspirations. We try to teach them to do so in a positive way. And in this way, the son can listen and also participate and also wanted to, to participate in the conversation. That's how we open the communications channels. PSFT is a systemic therapy. What this means is that we are keenly interested in how families interact with each other or how family members interact with each other. And we don't really focus so much on the topic of the interaction. Eventually that will be an important issue. But if we start working primarily on topics, then families in conflict can then engage in many arguments related to existing conflicts. But there are four to six different issues that we need to overcome to get families to talk to each other. So it's much more effective to work through interactions rather than topics to bring families together. And what happens with therapists, when therapists focus on the family's content, that which they discuss or talk about, and the various issues that are listed by family members, when they do that, they cannot help the family just like the family could not help itself because they get overwhelmed by all of these content problems that they have. So the therapist gets lost in this morass of content and oftentimes can feel overwhelmed. And we see this. Uh, we see this with therapists that work extensively with families. They seem overwhelmed. They're drowned up to their next in conflict. And the idea there is for them to take a step back, look at the broader perspective and analyze the interaction patterns between the family members. So in BSFT, what we do is we allow families to resolve their own content issues, ergo what they're going to argue about or fight about. Whereas therapists try to focus in helping them improve how they interact with each other, how they resolve their issues or problems. For example, some parents might say, or the mother in a family might say, you're like this because you're always coming home late and you've been drinking. And so the topic of conversation focuses on the absence of the father when the son arrives and the mother feels like the father could do more. But then if the father hears this, he might respond to her and say, you're not a good mother. And so they get bogged down in these types of issues and they never get to the causality of the situation because the parents are focused on attacking each other. So the idea is to help families to focus and prioritize on the real or focus on prioritize the real problem. And they need to learn how to resolve their problems, how to address these different topics. We may not be able to help them on the content front, but we can help them learn how to converse and talk to each other in a much better way. One extremely important aspect of BSFT is that the therapy is completely organized based on the diagnostic. So what we diagnose are interaction patterns, such as the example that I cited about the father being very negative with his adolescent son. We need to help transform that into something positive. I discussed the example of how the mother and the father can't focus on the on the issues because they're they're attacking each other. They have their own issues. So these are interaction problems. So what we try to identify which of these interaction problems are related to the symptoms shown or exhibited by the family. And that's what we treat. So it's a much more reduced number in terms of interaction patterns, and that's what we need to try and change. So 
when we talk about a brief therapy session, I wanted to highlight characteristics that contribute to ensuring that the therapy is brief. Firstly, as I already mentioned, we try to focus on the interaction patterns rather than the content, which can be multiple or numerous. Secondly, we plan the sessions to be able to focus on changing these interaction issues that were diagnosed and primarily those related to the issue that is exhibiting itself. So it's a certain number of interaction patterns. For example, if the parents don't support each other, and I'll say parents or fathers, or uh, it could be many, many times a mother too, but generally we see a father and we see a boyfriend that lives with the mother and the family and the boyfriend is involved in the raising of the children, or we could have another dynamic where it's the mother figure and the grandmother. And so when the authority figures within the home do not collaborate with the upbringing of the children, this provides opportunities for children to rebel. And to put it kindly, they do whatever they want because there is no unified authority in the family. And so we focus on these uh, interactions specifically related to the issue at hand. And we try to bring about some practical interventions. And so the idea is to focus on the issue and we select a particular aspect of the facts that can bring about a behavioral change in a much quicker way. And we cannot simply focus on the fact that the parents believe that the young person is a disaster. And so we need to look at the aspects that are real, the affection or the feelings that the parents or the father or the mother feel towards the adolescent. This, when used as the vehicle to engage with these people, can help bring these people together because the spin is different. It's a much more positive approach. And this is how we frame the family's reality to bring about the change that they need. Lastly, a third characteristic that uh, ensures that BSFT is brief is that we establish a therapeutic system, therapeutic system in which the family accepts the therapist as a leader. So let's look at this. We can say that a family is a system and the members of the family are interdependent of each other as part of this system. And for a therapist to enter into this system, he or she needs to earn the trust and collaboration of all of the members. In order to achieve this, the therapist needs to look for something that each one of the members of the system wants from the therapy to understand what he can or she can provide. If we go back to the case where the father continues to refer to his son as a disaster, you might hear language like, you're always getting into trouble. I know that you don't like it when I talk to you like this. Let me try and help you with this. And the therapists offer each one of the members of the family something that they can benefit from the therapy. In this way, the family members allow the therapist to become the leader of this new system that now includes the therapist. And then working within that therapeutic system, he's not outside the family, he is within the therapeutic system. And as a result, the family is more likely to accept the interventions made by the therapist. 
So the reason why BSFT is brief is that continuously throughout the, the therapy, we focus on what makes it brief. And we do this by focusing on interactions, not the content, focus on interactions that are linked to the problem that has arisen. We plan sessions so that we don't get lost in the session so that we can stay focused on the interactions that have been diagnosed. We have to be practical. In other words, uh, choose one aspect of the interaction that uh, will lead to a change in the way the family interacts, and we set up an effective therapeutic system. So why, why is it that BSFT changes last beyond the therapy period? Well, the BSFT treatment as such is integrated into the daily life of the child, of his own environment, his context. In other words, when we bring about a change in the way the family interacts, then the family becomes its own therapeutic environment. And it is able to bring about a change in the symptoms of the adolescent. And that new therapeutic environment last persists beyond therapy and we have to work hard to make sure that every time we bring about a change in the way they interact it becomes sustainable that those changes last over time i'd also like to mention that bsft is based on transcultural or cross-cultural processes. In other words, it applies to many cultures because in all cultures, there are families who, who have, may have, the, the family per se may have different roles in different cultures, but there's always a family. And the role of the family is to support its members and the, members of the family, in other words, the people who um, have family roles tend to develop interdependence and they, therefore the family becomes a system. And that interdependence between the various members of the family is then expressed through interaction patterns that we can diagnose and change. From the cultural perspective, there's something important to mention here, which is that often one aspect that doesn't work well in a family is supported by the culture. For instance, once I was working in a community where all the men in that community uh, beat the women. And when women came to treatment, they were depressed. That was the, the symptom of the system was that the wife was depressed. And the interaction pattern was that they were abused by their husbands. Now, that could be a part of the culture in that town, but it's an aspect that has to be changed within the family in, other, in order to remove the depression symptom that the wife has. So sometimes there's something cultural that has to be changed. Also, for instance, very frequently, we see uh, cases of Latin Americans who come from the more traditional families, rural communities, and then move to the United States, where, where it's a much more individualist culture. And the kids rebel against their parents when the parents try to control them. And even though controlling your children was part of the culture they came from, we have to bring about it and help the parents change and develop new ways of uh, handling and negotiating with their children, because that's what's going to work in this US context. What are the goals of BSFT? Well, to eliminate the problem that 
exists or reduce it until it no longer is a problem. It could be, for instance, the use of drugs. Sometimes you can't eliminate the use completely in some contexts, but you can reduce it to the level that the adolescent can function effectively in all his different roles. And he doesn't uh, associate with other antisocial youth. Another goal is to develop the necessary skills so that the family can uh, live on its own. And then to correct the interaction uh, problem, interaction uh, patterns, to reduce chronic negativity, increase the sense of belonging and cohesion in the members of the family, improve the uh, ability of the members of the family to cooperate in the in bringing up the children and other aspects of family life well who who are the members of a family when i talk about a family in bsft we define a family from a functional perspective because depending on the culture there are different people who have a role in the family but all those people who have a regular interaction with uh, an individual a member of the family that has a problem all of those people who play a family role and have regular contact with the individual who is your patient we define as uh, part of the family that has to participate in therapy And finally, I'd like to talk about involving the entire family in, in many different therapies. People say, oh, the family is responsible. The patient is responsible for coming to therapy. The family is responsible for getting involved in therapy. But in BFST, we give that responsibility to the therapist, not to the family, because uh, a major part of the family that has children who have problems have family members who do not want to participate in therapy, and the family does not have enough knowledge or skill to get them to go to therapy. If so, if we if we ask. Uh, the, uh, the family to bring in the older brother or the grandmother or the father who doesn't want to come to therapy, it's not possible for them to do that. They can't, if they can't do it in their daily life, they're not going to be able to do it when we ask them to do so. That's why we as therapists have to become involved in this. And that's why the lack of in uh, the lack of interest on the part of the family to, to participate in therapy is something which we have to uh, acknowledge as a healthy characteristic of a family because all systems protect themselves. And so in this case, they're trying to protect the family. But in this case, they're protecting uh, a pro a something that has a problem. And we have to be able to intervene in such a way that we get a person who does not want to participate to participate directly. So BSFT does not depend on the family's ability to join therapy, but rather provides strategies to, for effective participation and bring the family to therapy. And what we've found through the research we've done on how involving you involve families is that when we change our own behavior as therapists, we are able to get all the members of the family involved. Thank you very much. And here are my contact points. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Jose, for your presentation excellent message, particularly the message about the importance of rebuilding uh, these family structure and operation. I'd like to point out that Dr. only spoke about drugs in one of his slides because, in, in, in effect, the, the 
purpose of this type of strategy, the focus is that the drug consumption, alcohol consumption is actually the result of the lack of protection that exists in the um, in their environment that helps protect a child or person from consuming drugs or participating in criminal activity. Uh, and they, and a, a youth can be protected if the family is strong about this. Thank you. Next, we have Anya Boos, and I'd like to ask the participants to please stay on. I know we have exceeded our time uh, frame, but the last presentation is a very important one. Anya is the uh, advisor at the United Nations Office Against Drug and Crime in the Prevention, Treatment and Rehabilitation uh, and the Drug Prevention and Health Branch. She has extensive experience and well-known experience in developing intervention strategies for the prevention and treatment of drug abuse. Her topic today is Treat Net Familia and its application in the Americas. You have for Anja's. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you, and it's always an honor to learn from the experts that have been speaking at this seminar. After Jose, it's a lot easier to talk about family therapy, and I'd like to present to you a family therapy model on uh, particularly on training material that are based on family therapy elements that we have developed jointly with other experts and which included Jose, for instance. And I'll speak a bit about how we can apply that tool in the Americas. I'll also talk about epidemi epidemiology of uh, family therapy and family therapy and how you can use the tool TreatNet Familia. I don't know if you, in terms of epidemiology, uh, I, I, uh, at the UN doc, we annually publish a world drug consumption of a publication. It alcohol excludes, al it, it excludes alcohol and tobacco, it's drugs. And what we have is that one of every 17 persons, almost uh, 300 million people, have used a drug in 2021. And the, this was the substance most used at the global level. We also estimated that almost 40 million persons suffer from uh, drug abuse disorders, but only one out of every five persons have access to uh, drug treatment programs. And the situation for adolescents, usually we hear from school questionnaires, but the estimate is that teenagers consume at a level greater than the general population, uh, the, 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 the marijuana, particularly in the AE region of the Americas and in some countries within the region. Terms. So they have a very young population that's currently undergoing treatment, whereby more than half of the patients currently in treatment at the present time are younger than 25 years of age, which is important to consider. We also have international mandates, including the uh, Drug uh, Commission, and it relates to the treatment for children, adolescents, and their issues related to substance abuse and consumption. This is resolution 58 slash two, and it is entitled support for the availability, accessibility and diversity of treatment and care to family members. So this is now part of policy and we base much of our interaction with uh, these uh, existing uh, materials, which include uh, international standards on prevention of drug use. And right now we have a, an official translation into Spanish 
for the international standards for treating the drug uh, abuse disorder. This is based on evidence that works very well and proves uh, to be very effective in both treatment as well as prevention. So how does family therapy work within this framework and with these tools that we have available to us? As we heard from Jose a little bit already, there are certain risk factors in adolescents such as, well, or that affect their substance abuse and other issues. We can see he, here that there are high levels of vulnerability and family problems associated with substance consumption, but also due to other issues such as delinquency. The UN office has always uh, asked that we look at different uh, types of actions with a more positive focus to try to address the needs of these people who have high rates of uh, drug abuse. And we see that some of these models have led to the development of evidence that serves to strengthen family therapy and focus the efforts on reducing substance consumption and mitigating adolescent delinquency rates. So I wanted to establish this as a context and even the WHO and UNODC has recommended family therapy for disorders stemming from uh, substance abuse based on international standards. The WHO, based on the evidence that we've already alluded to, is using a, a mechanism implemented in the Americas. Now I'd like to talk about the family treatment and the training packet that we offer. These materials, as we've already mentioned, are family therapy elements to provide treatment to adolescents who suffer from disorders related to substance and drug abuse, including adolescents that have problems with the justice or criminal system or actually show a great risk of being in contact with said system. So the objective is to develop uh, capacities among healthcare sector professionals and other social and criminal justice stakeholders. We won't focus so much on the theory, but as you can see, this is the primary focus on um, capacity building. The theory of change, which was alluded to by Jose, is based on these family-based interventions that can lead to a stronger cohesion within the family unit. And we also have the evidence and this is, if this is done properly, we will then see uh, drops in the rates of, uh, of adolescent violence and substance abuse. And this leads to better public health conditions and much better public safety. These are photographs of the period that where we were working on the development of this therapeutic model. We can see that uh, Jose was one of the members of the group of experts, as you can see here with the UNODC in Vienna, and with whom we worked extensively on many of these principles that serve to guide the family therapy model. They were very generous in sharing their knowledge about family therapy. We did conduct a number of pilots, primarily in the Asia region, but you can see here, nonetheless, the information that we can share with you and that relates to the materials that we have available for family therapy. Now, it does talk about basic theory, but the most important and salient of these materials is the one that relates to the various phases of treatment interventions and assessment methods related to family therapy. And these include, as an example, positive reformulation, relational reformulation, the different perspectives, uh, relational questions, and resistance. So 
there are additional issues and we focus also on resolution of problems and we practice micro learning and this is for train the trainer so we have people that already have experience working with adolescents they'll take a five-day in-person training program but we can do it now online and we don't only have some slides we also have instructions for the trainer additionally we have some evaluation materials case studies role-playing, skills practicing, discussion, lectures, videos, and a manual. And this is just to give you an idea of what we're talking about, that we have six sessions or less with a family, and this was used during a pilot in Indonesia. The objective was to have six sessions ranging from 90 to 120 minutes. And what you can see here is that many of the sessions were offered in the homes of the families. And this was extremely helpful. It was extremely helpful with regard to accessibility because many times families found it difficult getting to the facility that offered the service. And so instead, the program focused on providing the services in the home. So we have a number of phases with the corresponding objectives. I'm not gonna to delve too deeply in the details here, but what you can see here is how these six sessions are properly structured. And we also have five to seven phases related to the treatment and this is it or this doesn't necessarily follow the pattern that session one needs to be done during phase one or anything like that and it also addresses all the key elements for interventions and the goals and objectives that you can set up for each one of the sessions so these are the initial results that we got from uh, treatment familia one of the cases that was uh, implemented on site in asia towards the beginning of the pandemic. So the truth is not all of the families were able to complete all six sessions. In some cases, they completed a smaller number of sessions. And what we could demonstrate was the viability of implementation in these uh, environments and with the support of community resources and both prior or rather during and after the pandemic, we were able to provide the training online. Something important that we can demonstrate relates to the reduction in the use of substances. This includes alcohol, marijuana, and amphetamines. And in many cases, uh, adolescents that received the treatment started uh, restricting the number of friends that were engaged in this type of antisocial behavior and that uh, practiced uh, excessive uh, uh, drug abuse and alcohol abuse. There was a significant reduction in mental health issues, which was also very important. So this is already in the, the scientific literature and easily accessible by all of you. So based on these positive results, we have integrated treatment familia in a complete package for treatment, which is the training program developed by UNODC to provide uh, treatment to, or treatment on the program for substance abuse reduction. And as I mentioned earlier, we have the official translation into Spanish already available. You can click on the link and access that translation. Now, some a few words about the implementation that we've had so far in Latin America and that we would like to extend and expand in the Americas. So far, Colombia, Ecuador, Panama, and Peru have been working with TreatNet Familia. Sometimes we work uh, online. And in Colombia, for example, we work uh, directly in country. And I'd like to share some of the data related to the evaluations and the process assessment. Now, in the Americas, we don't have these impact data. And so in 
Columbia, we were able, able to train 33 trainers for family therapists. And we repeated the exercise in 15 different territories and countries so far. The impact of the training was that we saw a significant increase in the knowledge base for these healthcare professions, professionals. Additionally, we saw an impact on the training in terms of the level of knowledge that pertains to familiar or family aspects. Uh, and this was uh, more theoretical, but we also uh, expanded uh, the professional's knowledge of uh, the positive reinforcement that treatment techniques. The overall satisfaction that we saw with Treatnet Familia included that many participants said that the training really served to improve their skills in this subject. And so they were all very satisfied that they not only acquired new knowledge, but new skills that they can use in their day-to-day -day work. One thing that I wanted to say about this session in which we are engaged in today and that we're, we're using to talk about brief interventions, many of the trainers we have trained have said that one of the potential difficulties is time and time availability. So, so far we've been in Colombia with 33 train the trainers. Uh, they have duplicated that effort. And uh, so far we've trained more than 550 people in the entire country or rather in all of the regions. With that, I have nothing further. Thank you very much for your attention. If you're interested in uh, Adopting uh, TreatNet Familia in your countries, we have materials available in both English and Spanish. And uh, I wanted to show you a brief uh, video today to show you a little bit about TreatNet Familia. With that, I thank you for your attention and for the invitation to take part in this webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anya, for your presentation. You provided a very important uh, summary of the work that you've been doing in the Americas, uh, the focus on family therapy, the available instruments, and you've already answered a number of the questions that we received in the chat from the people that are joining us here today about the possibility of uh, getting some of that train the trainer's um, knowledge. To all of the speakers, thank you for dedicating this time to us today, for sharing your knowledge and experience. Likewise, I want to uh, thank all of the attendees that number more than 500 and that stayed with us during the whole session. On behalf of the Pan American Health Organization, we'd like to invite you to the session that we have tomorrow on mental health. Please uh, be on the lookout for any notices that you'll get from us about these different courses or sessions. Thank you very much to all of you, and we look forward to seeing you in future sessions. Thank you. Goodbye. Saludos a todos desde México.